In this video, we'll take the concepts we learned from semantics and pragmatics and apply them to the study of sign language. And in particular, we're going to focus on the relationship between the signifier and the signified, between the structure of a word in a sign language and their meaning. First of all, words in sign languages are not a pantomime of an action. If, if you want to do the word, the word to walk, you don't move your legs like you're walking. This would be pantomime. The words in sign languages are words. They're constrained by the phonological inventory of the sign language. One very important restriction is that words in sign languages can be articulated with your hands, with your torso, and with your face, but not with your legs. Take a look at the pantomime that we have on the left, which uses the legs, versus the two words in sign languages that we have. Uh, to walk in American Sign Language and in Nihon Shua in the Japanese Sign Language. You can see how the ASL word uses the hands, also the Japanese one. Yes, for sure, they do resemble walking. Uh, the, Japanese, the word from Japanese sign language kind of looks like legs moving, and the one from ASL kind of looks like feet shuffling. But you can only guess that after I've told you what the signs actually mean. There's some resemblance between them, but there's still a lot of arbitrariness going on. In spoken languages, we have words that resemble the sensory perception of the action or the thing. For example, onomatopoeias kind of resemble the sounds of nature, and ideophones kind of resemble the, the sensory perception of something. For example, kira kira in Japanese meant twinkling. So spoken languages do have those kinds of words that are meant to evoke a perception. Sign languages have these words as well. And in general, words in sign languages may resemble uh, some perception of an action or a thing. We call this property iconicity. So those words are very iconic that have that do have some strong evocation of a sensory perception, and there's words that are that have very low iconicity, where there's practically no connection between the word and its meaning. So high iconicity means that the sign does evoke something in the real world. Low iconicity means it doesn't. But even then, even if it's the highly iconic sign, the connection between it and its meaning is still arbitrary. Take a look at this word. This is a word from the Brazilian Sign Language, from Libras. I'll give you a few seconds to try to figure out what it means. So what does it mean? I'm going to give you a hint. I'm going to play the same word but in the Icelandic sign language. I'm going to let you look at them for 10 seconds. Try to figure out what this, what these words mean. Mm -hmm. What do you think? They mean drink. So the Brazilian one is focusing on the action of taking something to your mouth. And the Icelandic word is focusing on the vessel, on the glass, which then you tip over Yes, it's, they're very iconic, but also you can only really guess what they mean after you know the meaning. You, uh, you can see after they've told you that they mean to drink, that it's like, oh yeah, it's kind of like a glass, or it's kind of like putting liquid in your mouth. But it, even these two signs are focusing on different aspects of the action. They're not perfect imitations of the concept to drink. Let me show you another example. These are three words from the South African Sign Language. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds, and you please try to figure out what these words mean. Hmm. What do you think they mean? They mean the following. The first one means bus. The second one means man. The third one means afternoon. Did, did you guess correctly? So now that you know their meanings, try to figure out what the sign could possibly be related to and then order them from most iconic to least iconic. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. Mm 
All right, what do you think? At least to me, they kind of go like this. Probably number two is the most iconic because maybe it looks like a beard or something like that. Uh, number one is kind of iconic. This is probably be like probably be like the roof of the bus or where you uh, grab on, to, uh, hold on to for the bus. Maybe number three means like the sun being like after the middle or something like that. So to me, number two is the most iconic and number three is the least iconic. But again, notice what happened. Uh, it's very difficult to tell what a sign actually means. And this is because the connection between the sign and its meaning is arbitrary. Yes, it might have some resemblance to a perception of the object or the action, but the way it is reinterpreted through the phonology of the sign language makes it so that it's ultimately as arbitrary as the phonemes of a spoken word. Here's a final example. This is a word from the American Sign Language, from ASL. What does it mean? Hmm? This word means coffee. Coffee because it's like one of those old time coffee grinders. So you can see how if you were born 50 or 60 years ago, this might have some connection with coffee. But if you, if you use ASL today, there's no way that this uh, has any connection to how you prepare or drink coffee. So this symbol is completely arbitrary. In, in the mind of a younger speaker, there would be no connection between this action and coffee. So this is a sign that is just as arbitrary as any word in a spoken language. So the main idea here is that sign languages are not a pantomime. They are they, they're words, and the words in these languages have two components, the, signified, the signifier and the signified, just as in spoken languages. It's just that maybe the signifier can have some degree of iconicity. Other than that, the, the sign languages work exactly the same as spoken languages. They depend on context to decipher meaning. They have elements like dyxis and anaphoras. So these are sentences from the sign language of the Netherlands. I have new neighbors. I saw them yesterday. The man and the woman work at the University of Amsterdam. He teaches philosophy and she biology. They have an element that we talked about before called index, which kind of stores something in a little section of space and then when you point at that uh, region of space again, it, you don't have to repeat the word. For example, you can have um, man index 3a, and then when you point at the, uh, the spot 3a again, it will be like he. It will essentially work like a pronoun. And if you have woman index 3b, and then in later discourse you point at 3b, this will mean she, because the word woman is now stored in this region of space. So you'll have man index 3a, woman index 3b, and then in the following sentence you have index 3b philosophy teach, index 3b biology. He philosophy teaches, she biology. So these work like pronouns and in essence these two regions of space are getting their meanings from the preceding discourse. And I want to show you one final thing that's related to pragmatics. And it also occurs in spoken languages. So people have noticed that there are metaphor systems running through our languages. So there are many expressions that share a common metaphor. In English, for example, we have the metaphors happy is up and sad is down. For example, in I'm feeling up, my spirits rose. That boosted my spirits. You're in high spirits. Versus I'm feeling down, my spirits sank. I fell into a depression and he's really low these days. There's many metaphors running through English. For example, time is money, like you spend money, but you spend time, but you also save time, you invest time. Um, so these systems of metaphors are pervasive throughout languages. Happy is up and sad is down is present in, North, in the culture of North America. So this other language that's also used in North America also has the metaphors up is happy is up and sad is down. In ASL, happy or positive signs generally have upward motions like pride, and sad signs have uh, downward motions like depressed. Uh, 
So you can see happy signs move up, uh, sad signs move down, same as we had in the spoken languages in English. In summary, the words in sign languages are also made up of signifiers and signified, and the relationship between these two is arbitrary, just as in spoken languages. However, there might be some degree of iconicity in how the sign is produced, from signs that are more iconic to less iconic. Um, sign languages have anaphoras, they have speech acts that can be direct or indirect, and they have systems of metaphors running through them, as spoken languages do.